lost her dad. Her mother is there, and, and, and her mother is, is, you know, I know hurting. Her, her brother is hurting. Callie's hurting. But the church is hurting with her. Because when someone we love hurts, we hurt too. So Callie is going through a very difficult time. And, and, and again, Clifton says, now, Rob, what are we going to do? I said, Clifton, we're going to let, let time take its course. We're not going to do anything right now. We're going to, we're going to let Callie heal. And we'll revisit this several months down the road. About six months had, had come. And I said, Clifton, I said, get Callie muscle in a shovel. Just let her read it. Because it's, it's something she can do on her own. So Callie gets muscle in a shovel. She reads it. She loves the book. And, and Clifton said, Callie, I love the book. I said, well, great. I said, now's the time. I said, invite Callie to come over to the house. He said, but Robbie said, what are we going to do about that question? I said, I'm not sure, Clifton. I said, I'm really not sure, but I, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to ask some wiser and older preachers. I'm going to look to some evangelists, but we'll deal with that question. We'll be ready. So Callie comes over to the house. Nicole's made a nice meal and has made her dessert. And Clifton, we just sit around and eat. And eventually I said, now Callie, I said, can we talk to you about the Lord? Sure. We love to talk about the Lord. I said, well, let's just do these booklets. We bring out booklet number one and we start going through booklet one. Now, let me tell you something about Callie. Before I could even get the, the verse open, Callie had the answer. Callie knows. She knows those Bible verses and she knows those answers probably quicker than some of us in this room. Callie has been paying very close attention to every question. So we go, we just fly through book one, like an hour, under an hour finished. And Callie said, I said, Callie, any questions? She said, no, I believe all that, Rob. I said, great, come back, for, come back next week, let's do book two. So we come back next week, we do book two once again. I mean, it doesn't matter, instrumental music, not, no problem for Callie. She says, no, she says, I get it. It's not in the Bible. She says, I, I get the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. So, so I get the name of the church. We, we, we glorify Jesus. So again, no, no issues, no problems whatsoever. And so Callie's pretty much filling the book out without us even reading the Bible verses. All they were reading, every one of them. We come to book three. Clifton calls and he said, Rob, you realize what's going to happen, don't you? I said, I know. I said, I know, Clifton. It's, it's, it's going to be really rough. I, I said, Clifton, two things we need to do. Number one. When we get to this issue, she asks those hard questions about dad. I don't want you to apologize for the truth. We are not apologetic for the Bible. We're not going to apologize for what the Bible said. That's rule one. Rule two, it, rule two is when this happens, we're going to love her as much as we can. So Nicole's going to be sitting right next to her. She's going to have a box of tissues because we're going to have it ready. We know this is going to be a motion. We're going to embrace her, love her. We will not let her walk through this alone. And, uh, and we're going to, number three, we're going to pray about this. We're going to do a lot of praying. Now, I realize when, when Callie comes into this third study, that Callie already realizes that she may not be going to heaven. In fact, when we ask Callie in, on page 47 of that workbook, you know, is, is, are you saved? She puts down unsure. Now, when someone puts down unsure, that normally means they're lost. It's a rare person that puts down I'm lost. Now, I've met a few of them, but it's rare that we find someone who says I'm lost. So Callie's put down unsure. So we're going through book number three. Callie has no problem with sin. She has no problem with faith, repentance, confession. Brothers and sisters, she doesn't have any problem with baptism. She knows what the Bible says. Now we get to the conclusion. I said, Callie, since you love the Lord and you know what the Lord wants you to do, are you ready to do what the Lord wants you to do right now? And she got real quiet. And her head dipped and her, her hand began to shake. And those tears just started dripping one at a time on the table. Callie wasn't talking anymore. Callie was hurting. And she wouldn't talk. I said, Callie, what's wrong? Nicole just kind of scoops up next to her, puts her arm around her. I said, Callie, are you okay? She just shook her head like this. I said, Callie, I, I think I know what you're, you're thinking about. Well, can I speak for you just for a minute? Can I, can I be you just for a minute? And you tell me if I'm, I'm doing this right. She kind of shook her head. I said, you're worried about your dad, aren't you? She said, I said, I understand. I, I, I completely understand that. I said, can I, can, I, can, I, can I help you walk through this? And she kind of shook her head. So we've come to the, the, the question that most people are really concerned about. Because you're going to study with somebody and they're going to say, what about mama? What about granddad? What about my sister? 
What about my wife? What are you going to do with that question? I want to share with you what we did when that question was asked. I said, Kelly, was your dad a good man? And she said, oh, yes, he, he was a good man. Now she's starting to smile. I said, did he provide for your mom and your brother and you? Yes. I said, did he, did he love you? Yes, he loved us. Did, did, he, did he take care of you and, and, and give you all the things that you needed? Oh, yes. I said, Callie, was your dad an honest man? She said, yes. I said, Callie, did your dad know what you know right now? She said, I don't think so. I said, did no one taught your dad this? She said, no, I don't, I don't think so. I said, Callie, if your dad knew what you knew right now, being an honest and good man, what do you think he'd do? In fact, Callie, if your dad right now could speak to you, and what do you think he would tell you to do with what you've learned? Being an honest and good man. Callie said, he'd tell me to obey God. I said, Callie, I think that's exactly what you need to do. I think you need to obey God. And you know that's what your dad would want you to do. I said, well, why don't we do it right now? I thought at that time, I said, Callie's going to obey the gospel. I said, I, I said, we have crossed the hurdle. She sees it. She knows her dad would want her to do what's right. And we're not talking about her dad. We're talking about Callie. I can't, I can't change her dad. I, I'm going to leave that between her dad and God. And I told Callie that. I said, I'm not a judge. I said, your dad's a good man. And, and I said, I'll leave that between you and God. But Callie, right now, you've got to do what you know is right. He said, we're going to go to the baptistry. But then she stops. And she said, but, but, but before I do this, Rob, she said, what about my brother? I said, what do you mean, your brother? She said, but I, I want my brother to obey too. And I said, I gotta wait, a, I gotta teach my brother this because my brother and I gotta do this together. And I knew right there a roadblock had, had, had presented itself. Callie, she's a good young lady, and she wants your brother to obey the gospel. So she she I mean, how do you fault a young lady for wanting to teach her brother so they both can obey at the same time? But I also know if she doesn't obey now, she'll probably not obey. And I realize if she does not obey now, her brother is not going to obey. And so I looked at Callie and I said, Callie, here's what life has taught me. That if you do not obey now, you're probably not going to. And if you really want your brother to obey, someone's got to show him the way. And if you're not willing to show him the way, then Callie, who's going to? Is your mother going to show him the way? Who's going to show him the way, Callie? I said, Callie, right now you have an opportunity to show your brother the way. And he's going to follow in your footsteps. What you do now, Callie, if it's your brother, you've got to show him the way. And Callie says, you're right. She says, I will show him the way. And that's exactly what she did. We took her that very hour to the baptistry and we baptized her into Christ. It was one of the most emotional conversions we've ever been through. But the story doesn't stop there. Because soon after Callie became a Christian, she wanted to share that news with her family. So she's going to go home and say, Mom, you, I, want you to, I want you to hear what happened. You know, I became a Christian tonight. I was baptized. You became what? Yeah, Mom, I became a Christian tonight. I was a Christian. Kelly, you're already a Christian. Yeah, but I, I was baptized at the church. The church of what? Kelly, do you know what your father would do if he knew that you were just baptized in the church of Christ? Yeah, Kelly, we're not, we don't go to that church. We're Baptists. How dare you betray your dad's life? How dare you do that? Kelly started to cry. She didn't know what to do. She said, Clifton, my mom's not, she's angry with me. She said, Clifton, what, what am I going to do? She says, I, mom is so upset. She's yelling and screaming. She, and know what she said? She said, my brother can never go back to church again. She said, I ruined it. <laughs> we were at Bible camp shortly thereafter. And my phone rang. It was Clifton. He said, Rob, we, Cal is about to give up. She, she thinks she's made a terrible mistake. She said, what do we do now? And I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to do what we did when she was baptized. We're going to surround her with love. So I called one of the elders. I said, with the human and I said, I need you and Joe to have Callie over to your house tonight. I need you to cook dinner. I need you to have, surround her with love. I need you to let her pour her heart out to you tonight. I need you to be a shepherd tonight to Callie. And that's exactly what our elders did. Called her over to the house, got Clifton over there. And Callie just cried. And they held her. And they said, Callie, the Lord loves you. And you're not alone. Others have traveled down this road. And someday, 
and you get better. Your mother won't stay angry forever. You can understand she's hurt. She doesn't know what you know. But someday if you're faithful, you'll get to teach not only your mother, you'll get to teach your brother. The Catholic, don't give up. If you don't stay faithful, they'll never come to know Jesus. And Callie stayed faithful. Callie was so upset because she wouldn't let she wouldn't let Chandler come to church. And uh, Chandler was learning. Chandler was coming. And Chandler loved to come to church. And I noticed Chandler's not coming. I don't see him anymore. I said, Clifton, uh, they won't let him come, will they? She said, no. She will not let him come or I'll. And I said, well, you just be patient. Clifton, someday you'll get to teach Chandler. I have no doubt about that. A few weeks passed by and Clifton called me. He said, Rob, you never guess what happened. Cal and I went upstairs to, to Chandler's room. Do you know what Chandler was doing up there on the computer? I said, what? He was listening to your sermon. I said, really? Yeah, in fact, he's got this, this website. He listens to all these preacher sermons. He listens to sermons all over the place. All these church, maybe one of yours, Brother Johnson. I don't know. But every, he's listening to sermons. He loves to listen to sermons. I said, that's great. And I said, Clifton, if you can teach him the gospel. I can't do it, but you can. He said, but what about mom? I said, don't worry about mom right now. I said, you do what's right. God will take care of this. I believe that. But I believe God will always take care of things if we're faithful. But you got to trust him. And we got to do our part. And so Chandler, as he's, he's studying his Bible, he calls me. We were in the bathroom getting ready Sunday morning service. He said, Rob, uh, he said, this Chandler. I said, hey, Chandler. I said, uh, he said, I need to talk to you. I said, what do you need, Chandler? He says, I, I want to be baptized. I said, Chandler, God bless you for that. I said, I, I would, there's nothing I'd like more than to baptize you, son. He said, I said, but I can't do that unless you have your mother's permission. I mean, I just can't. The law won't let me. You're 17 years old. You're a senior in high school. I realized, but I can't do that. I said, you've got to make things right with mom. You have got to go talk to mom. And he said, but I just can't sleep. I said, son, I have sympathy. I know you're, you're hurting. I'm hurting for you. But you have got to, you've got to somehow talk to your mother about this. And who knows, maybe the Lord will use this to help your mother. He said, I'll see you soon. And I said, I'll be looking for you. We walked into the church building and I looked around. No Chandler. And I was just looking at that back left exit where Calvin comes in. And we were talking and all of a sudden... In walks Chandler. I ran up to Chandler. I hugged him. I said, son, it's so good to see you. I said, you tell me about your mama. He looked at me and said, she's on her way. She's coming. I said, to this church? He said, yes, mama said she come for my baptism. I said, Chandler, I'm so excited. As soon as your mom walks into this church building, we'll baptize you. It was the Lord's Supper. We just finished. And his mama walked in. I got up in front of the church. And this is what I said. I said, in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost... Peter was interrupted, and they baptized 3,000 souls. This morning, we've been interrupted, and we're going to baptize Chandler Hudson into Christ. And that's exactly what we did. We took this young man, and we baptized him. And today, Chandler and Callie are some of the most faithful Christians we have that we let Church of Christ. Brethren, someday, I have no doubt about this. Someday, Mama is going to obey the gospel. As long as Chandler... And Cali remain faithful. Those difficult questions are only difficult if we don't have faith in Christ. If you don't believe in Jesus and you don't really believe that he can help you, Satan will use those questions to cause you not to practice personal evangelism. He'll cause you to be afraid. He'll cause you to think, what if? And you'll never do it. But friends, I promise you there is not a question that we're not prepared to answer. In 2 Peter 1, 3, according to his divine power, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Every answer is in this book. And God will help you through it. You do a lot of praying. And I'm going to illustrate this. I'm going to give you a few more uh, difficult, uh, difficult uh, situations that we've experienced in personal evangelism. What if their answer changes? And let me illustrate what this means. We'll talk more about this on Wednesday night. But we're going to, we always give a religious survey. I try to give it in book one, but I don't always. Sometimes it's just not right in book one to ask those questions. Because the prospect is nervous. And if they're nervous, I'm not going to ask these questions. So I'll wait until book three. But I will ask them. One of the questions in, in the survey that, I, that I, is necessary, you need the survey. And here's the question. Were you saved before or after baptism? It's real simple. 
Now, I've been, we've been doing this for, for 20 years. We've probably studied with some 200 people. And in those in that period of time, I'm 99.9 .9 of them, 99.9 .9 of them say the four. Because that's what denominational teaching is all about. You're saved before you're baptized. Baptism is either a way to get into the church, acknowledgement of your salvation, uh, unnecessary. So people put it before. But now, here's what happens. When you're studying the scripture with people, they begin to learn. That's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, they begin to learn you're saved after. So guess what? When you get to the part of the, the, the study that, that where, where you're concluding it, all of a sudden their answer, which was before, now is after. They changed their answer. Oh, I've always believed it was after. Now, that's why you do the survey. This is why we go to this question right here. And we make sure that we pull this out. Now, I don't, I don't use this very often. But this is what we call the, the honesty trap. We want to make sure they're honest. And some people are just not honest. And friends, I, I can, I'll be very plain with you tonight. You won't baptize a dishonest person. If a person is not honest, and by the way, humble... No, they will not go to heaven. There's not one person in this room that's not honest and humble that will go to heaven. Prideful people don't go to heaven. And dishonest people don't go to heaven. And so if those characteristics don't, don't describe the person you're studying with, it's not going to work. And so every now and then a person just changes their answer. And so I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. And I'm going to share with them. I said, do you remember that little questionnaire we, we filled out? You put after here. But you put before here. I'll tell you what I think's happened. I know you're an honest person. And I know you love the Lord. I believe you were honest when you said you were saved before baptism. And I think you've learned the truth. And because you're so honest, you've got to put down after you now. Don't you realize, my friend, that what you've done is you've changed the answer because your understanding of the truth has changed. Most people, that's all it takes. But there are very, very few people that they just won't accept that. They're going to say something like this. Well, no, 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 no. I meant to put, I meant to put the after. I, I really believe it was after. Now, how do you deal with those people? Patiently. Don't tell them they're going to hell. You don't tell them they're wrong. You don't judge their hearts. You patiently teach them. And sometimes it takes years. Sometimes they'll sit in your pews. And you know what? They think they're saved. And I never tell them they're lost because it's not my job. But the word of God will be the judge. Did you know every now and then one of them will come forward? Melody Allen did that many, many years ago. She walked forward and she says, you know, when they studied with me, I said I was, I was, a, I was saved after baptism. She says, I wasn't. I changed my answer. And this morning I want to become a Christian. It was wonderful. But sometimes it just takes a while. So don't ever give up on it. But every now and then you're going to need that person that this doesn't help. But this is what you do. You make sure you got the survey. And the survey is going to help you almost every time. But there is a person that you're going to meet someday. And it won't. You just got to be very patient with them. Here's one of the things we do to help a person. When, when you're doing the study, you're going to come to a passage in Mark 16, 16. It's in book 3, the red booklet. And before they read the passage, it's important, before they read it, you bring out this chart. This chart is in that personal evangelism workbook. If you've got it, I don't know what page number it's on, but this chart is there. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to open the booklet. You're going to show them the chart. They're going to say, would you read that for me, please? They're going to read these two statements. He who believes is saved and then baptized. He who believes is baptized shall be saved. You're going to say, pick the one you did. You know which one they're going to pick? Pick one. They all pick one. I can count on less than one finger how many people pick two. They don't pick two because they're not talked to. They're taught one. Now, I want you to notice what we're going to do. We're going to read Mark 16, 16. You know what you do when you read Mark 16, 16? See, you're wrong. You see that? You're wrong. No, you don't do that. You missed it. No. You don't say anything. You just make sure they see it. Let God's word do the work. You don't have to tell them. You don't have to show it to all. you got to do is let them read it. Brothers and sisters, you put yourself in their shoes. They just marked number one and they just read number two. And they realized what they read and what they did is not together. Don't you think that shakes their faith a little bit? That's just one of the ones you're going to use. You're going to do this over and over and over again. And eventually, they're going to be convicted. Because of the word of God. Not because of your persuasive speech. And not because of your good looks. 
but because of the power of the gospel. What about my religious experience with Sheila? When we were studying with Sheila, she, uh, she, she wanted to, she told it to me more than one time. Sometimes she said, you don't believe me, Rob. I know you don't. Don't laugh. Don't snicker. Don't tell him you don't. Now, you know that didn't happen. You, you know God doesn't work like that. You know God doesn't speak to you. She really believed God was speaking to her. I, I believe she believes that. You know, I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul. When he went to Athens and he saw that there were more gods than people, he gathered the people together. He says, I perceive that in all things, you're very religious. But I'm going to declare to you the unknown God whom you ignorantly worship. And Paul preached the sermon on Mars Hill. I suggest we do like Paul did. And we acknowledge something good. You know what Paul did? He found something good that the Athenians did. They were religious. That was good. But they were just worshiping the wrong God. Now we've got to show them the right way. And so we have to be mindful of their position. We're not there to make fun of them. We're not there to, 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 to argue with them and say, you know, God doesn't. This is not a time to discuss miracles or how God talks or dreams or visions. If she believes she's had a vision, let her believe she's had a vision. All right. I know what the Bible says. And so when the religious experience happens, you know what you need to keep studying. I just kept going. I said, Sheila, I'm so thankful. And that you are so devout. I said, I wish more people love the Lord like you do. And I mean that. You find something good to say. Keep going. What if they're living together? I've got something I, I want to share with you. All these stories I share by permission. I know they're personal. But every one of these stories I share by permission. You know what they tell me? They say, Rob, if sharing our personal stories helps someone go to heaven, you tell it. I'm going to share something very personal. This is Amy and this is Evan, Evan Burkle. This is Jackie and Sheila's son. When we were doing those Bible studies, we noticed that there was a young man who kept going up and down the stairs. And he'd stop and listen, he'd go down the stairs. He'd come up and listen, go back down the stairs. There's this young lady who went up and down the stairs too. Her name's Amy, I don't know her, but I know that's Jackie's son. After Jackie and Sheila became Christians, I said, Jackie, I said, I said, I'll tell you what we need to do. We gotta teach. Uh, Evan. I said, Jackie, you're the perfect person to do it. I'm going to give you these little booklets. You're going to be able to teach that. Ah, I can't do that. I said, you're Jackie. This is so, you are the perfect man. Teach. You need to teach Evan the gospel. And I said, you can do No, Rob, you don't understand. You can't make Evan do that. I said, don't have to make him. I, I got a plan, a strategy. Here's what we're going to do. And I explained it out. He said, no, it won't work. And Sheila kept saying, now, Jackie, you got to teach Evan. I'm going to teach Evan. I said, don't, Sheila. You're not going to teach Evan. Jackie's going to do it. And he said, no, Rob. I said, okay. I said, can I do it? He said, sure. Now, I know that uh, I know that Evan likes airplanes. I said, I got him. I said, Evan. I said, how would you like going to play, ride? You going to take me? I said, take you up for a plane ride. I said, we'll get in the plane. I'll take you around the lake at Dale Hollow. And we'll, uh, well, it'd be a great day. And uh, so we got up, got up to the airplane, went around Dale Hollow. In fact, uh, got over to Livingston, Tennessee. And there was a thunderstorm coming. I said, Evan, we're going to land at Livingston. He said, have you ever landed here? I said, no, there's an airport somewhere. we got to find it. Help me very quickly. So we're looking around. We finally found the airport, landed, and thunderstorm passes over. And we get back in the plane. We get home. And Evan, we were having a great time. It was, we had a great day together. And he loved it. I leaned fly a little bit, landed back in Lafayette. And I said, uh, lunch. Evan, want to go lunch? I'm, I'm, I'm me. I'm me. Gas is on me. Planes on me. I said, food's on me. Subway, let's go. And so we went over to Subway, and uh, I, I just know we have set the perfect. We've set. We got it perfectly planned out. And uh, and the kids and Nicole sometimes laugh at me because I always tell them this is what's going to happen. Normally it happens that way. And I said, now, this is what's going to happen. And they all, Dad, you know, no. I said, yes, it will happen just like this. I know. So I have this perfectly planned out in my mind. So I look at Evan. I said, Evan. I said, hey. Hey, uh, can you come over to the house for a couple of minutes? I got something. I, I want to talk to you about the Lord for a minute. I said, How's that? And he said, Nope. And I said, and I said, Something's wrong here. I said, Evan, I said, We're going to go to the house talk about Nope, don't want to talk about the Lord. I said, I just paid for his meal. I said, Gas and airplane? I said, What do I got to do to talk about the Lord with this man? And I said, You need to go back to the airplane. I'll give you to talk to the Lord up there. And, uh, you know, I, I said, I'm in the wrong place. And, and, uh, and, and so Evan uh, says, no, I don't want to talk about the Lord. I said, okay. I said, that's fair. I said, Evan, when you're ready to talk about the Lord, would you let me talk about it? He said, I will. 
So uh, I went home and said, Nicole, he, he's not going to do it. So we kind of we kind of just still friendly. Saw Evan. We go over to the house a lot, Jackie. Evan would be there. Always talk to Evan. Didn't ignore him. Just want to make sure he was there. And, uh, you know, Scarlett, remember the, their daughter who really helped bring her parents to Christ? Remember her in the first lesson? Scarlett uh, had a plan, too. Scarlett's a soul winner. And uh, Scarlett took muscle and a shovel, and she gave that to Amy. She said, Amy, you read that. We're at camp again, and the phone rings, and, uh, Rob, this is Amy. I barely know who she is. Barely know Amy. And uh, I said, yeah, Amy, uh, Evan's girl. Yeah. She says, I, 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 she says, I need to talk to you. I said, well, sure. I said, she said, I need to talk to you right now. I said, well, what's, what's wrong? She says, I read this book. It scared me. I think I, I, may, I may be going to hell. I said, what book did you read? She said, muscle and a shovel. And she said, she said, I, I can't live. I said, I, I've got, I need to talk to you, Nicole. I said, Amy, as soon as we get back home, we'll talk. I said, but, I, I said, as soon as we get home, we'll talk. And she said, but, but Rob, one condition. I said, what is it? You got to talk to Evan too. I said, Amy, Evan don't want to talk. She said, I know, but, but, but you got to talk to Evan when you talk to me. I said, Amy, you can't make Evan talk. And she, I said, but I have a plan. So let's try plan two. Plan two is this. You're not going to invite Evan to the Bible study. You're just going to make sure Evan knows we're going to have a Bible study, but you're not going to invite him. Don't tell him to come to the study. If you tell Evan to study, he's not going to study. Tell him not to study. He might study. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make sure Evan knows, but Evan isn't going to be asked. She said, she said, you think that'll work? I said, it's better than anything else we try. So let's just, just see. So Sheila makes a big supper, lunch, after Sunday at church. And we come over, eat spaghetti and salad. And we enjoy a good time, uh, dessert. And um, Sheila's over there and Scarlett and Jackie. And we're all excited. Kids are over there. And, and um, then, uh, then uh, uh, we get the Bible out. As soon as that Bible comes out, Evan, boom, there he goes. Walks out the back door. Had a Mustang like Steve's there. And, uh, and uh, gets in his Mustang. I can hear a start up. Boom, takes off down the road. And he's gone. Amy is devastated. Sheila's so hurt. She says, Rob, what do we do, Rob? I said, I said, Sheila, I don't know. I said, just let it be. I said, Amy, we have got to study the Bible. So Amy and I, we start. We're in the book like page three. And all of a sudden, I hear that car come back. And it parks, and in comes Evan. And he sits down at the table. Scarlett is so excited. She grabs her Bible and gives it to Evan. Evan pushes the Bible right back. <laughs> and and, 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 and uh, Amy says, here's a pencil. And here's back to the Bible. Don't want a pencil. Closes back to the Bible. Gives it back. I know we have a problem. You know what the problem is? Mama doesn't need to be there. Sister doesn't need to be there. In fact, we, we need to be alone. Evan doesn't want anybody there. So we finish book one and Evan listens. Evan doesn't answer any questions. He just listens. I said, how would you guys like to come to our house next week and we'll do book two? And Amy said, yeah, we can do that. I said, Evan, he said, yeah, I'll do that. So we come to our house. And Evan opens his Bible and he opens the booklet. And Evan starts studying the scripture. We go through book two, not a problem. I said, Nicole, we have a big problem with book three. Because Evan and Amy are living together and they don't think anybody knows. Evan's just bought a house. Amy has moved in. Everybody in the community knows, but they think nobody knows. In a small community, everybody knows everything. And I said, they got to repent. And she says, I, she said, we're going to have to deal with it. I said, I know. I said, I'm going to deal with this just like with Marlena and Terry. In fact, I'm going to use Marlena and Terry as our example. So we get to book three. We're in repentance. And I said, guys, can I tell you all a story about another couple we met long, you know, a few years ago in Kentucky? In Poole, Kentucky. Their names are Terry and Marlena Starks. I told them the same story I told you in lesson one about Terry and Marlena. About how they were living together. They repented. They were baptized. And we married them. <coughs> and I looked up at them. I said, I think we'll just stop right here for, for now. Evan says, what about the baptism? I said, ah. I said, Evan, why don't you and Amy take some time and think about this lesson. And then when you're ready to study it again, you call me and, and we'll study he says, okay. He said, all right, we'll do that. So Amy and Evan walk out the door. Now, this is what they talked about when they walked out the door. Amy looks at Evan and she says, Evan, do you think they know about us? <laughs> and we knew. We went to polishing the pulpit the very next day. And uh, I was teaching one of these lessons. And I told them, I told them about Amy and Evan. I said, uh, brothers and sisters, if my phone rings, I said, I'm leaving. I'm just waiting for that phone call. 
When I got home, it rained. This is how it went. Hey, Rob, this is Amy. Uh, I, I can't live like this anymore. I, I said, live like what, Amy? I just can't do this anymore, Rob. I, I can't live like this anymore. I can't sleep anymore. It bothers me, Rob. I, 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 need, I, 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 just, I can't do this anymore. I said, Amy, do what? I just wanted her to tell me. She said, uh, Evan and I live together. I said, Amy. She says, no, I moved out. I said, praise God. I said, where are you going? She said, live with grandmother. She said, would you meet me down to the church building because I want to be a Christian? I said, I'll be right there. And right behind her was Evan. And today they're faithful Christians. There's no problem too big that God can't solve it. But brethren, don't compromise on God's word. You'll be tempted. I want to, I want to share something with you. If you're, if you're going to be a soul winner tonight, you're going to have to have courage. Because you're going to be tempted to bend the rules. You're going to be tempted to, to allow things that you know God wouldn't allow because you just don't want to hurt somebody. You have to respect God's law to be a soul winner. You have to love God the more you love the people. God will work things out if you're faithful. What about marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Uh, we dealt with that. In fact, we dealt with it with this couple. Jimmy and Sharon Fisher. We were going through the study and we were talking. All of a sudden, uh, Sharon said, In my first marriage, and when he, she said, My first marriage, my heart just sunk. I said, Oh, no. I said, Please tell me that marriage is right. Please, 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 please tell me their marriage is right. And so um, I said, Well, when we get to book three, we're going to have to deal with it. So in book number three, you're going to deal with a section on sin. And one of those passages is 1 Corinthians 6. And it talks about you know, adulterer or feminine, abusers of themselves with mankind, fornicators, adulterers, shall inherit the kingdom of God. So when I get to that passage, I'm going to have to stop and ask them, like, do you understand the, what the word adultery means? Do you know what that now, Do you understand what God's law is on marriage? Because I know now. It's not like I know, I know there's an issue, so I've got to ask them. And so uh, I say, uh, Sharon, Jimmy, do you know? But before I do that, there's some things I need to discuss with you as a teacher. First of all, you've got to really understand this verse here again. I have yet many things to say unto you. You cannot bear them now. You do not start a Bible study with a, a Bible study on marriage, divorce, remarriage. They're not ready for that. This is not where you start. This is an end point. This is not a beginning point. It takes a lot of faith to do what's right in marriage. It's very emotional. It's extremely difficult. So this is not, this is the ending, not the beginning. In fact, if I knew that there was a serious marriage issue, I'm going to prolong the study and I'm going to allow as much faith to develop in the heart of the hearer as possible. I am not going to start with a steak. I will start with milk. We all need to understand that. So if you're studying with somebody, you think they got a marriage issue, please don't start with that. You, you delay that. You hesitate with that. Do not jump into that. But you are going to have to deal with this. That's why I said it takes courage to be a soul winner. It can be very tempting just to ignore it. My friends, let me, let me, let, let's think about that just for a minute. If you ignore it, you have not helped them. If you ignore sin, you're not helping a person go to heaven. If they're living in sin... Somehow you've got to teach them. Or how do you do it? I'm going to share with you how we do it. I try to make things simple. I like things to be kept at a very simple level. I like to keep it because people learn when things are simple. If things are hard, they just ignore you. Or they just shake their head and they don't mean it. First Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, no adulterers. I stop here in this passage during book three, read booklet. I said, I said, do you know what the word adultery means? She says, I think so. I said, well, let me share with you what it means in the Bible. Let's go to Matthew 19. We read verses one through nine. Now, as we're reading one through nine, we're not, that, that's verse number 12, and that's in verse number nine. Um, that's verse number nine on there. I'm trying to get to verse 12. As we read these verses together, there are four points I'm going to make. You may want to write these down. Now, these are four simple points that are made by Jesus. Number one, Jesus establishes the teaching God is the only one that can make marriage. Does he not say? Does it not say in scripture that God brings them together? What God has put together, that not man put asunder, that God formed Adam and Eve, man and woman? I mean, God made marriage. We all agree, right? God made marriage. Government doesn't make marriage. That's very obvious now, isn't it? 
I think if one thing the church has learned in the last couple of years is government doesn't make marriage. We need to learn that lesson. Government does not define marriage. If government says it's a marriage, it's only a marriage when God says it's a marriage, right? So if two men are married according to the government, it doesn't mean they're married, does it? So we have got to get that point down. If you don't understand that, you're not going to be able to teach somebody this. Only God makes marriage. Do you know what else I learned in that passage? God always makes marriage according to his law. And so if someone is not married according to his law, they're not married. If someone enters into a, a, a contract with another uh, with a woman or a man or, any, or two men or two women, if it's not according to the law of God, they're not married. I don't care what the law says or what they say. They're not married. Number three, only God dissolves a marriage. Not judge, is God. Do you know there's only one way he dissolves marriage? And that's, of course, what the verse says, according to his law. Whosoever put it away of life, except to be for fornication, marriage another, commits adultery. He that puts her that uh, uh, marries her that put away commits adultery. I mean, it's simple. So I said, do you understand that? She said, yes. Yeah. She said, Rob, she said, there's no problem here. I said, what do you mean, Sherry? She said, my first husband committed adultery. He went out of the marriage contract. And she says, I put him away. And I said, and Sherry, your marriage is fine. And I took a very big sigh of relief. Because <laughs> I love Jimmy and Sharon Fisher. And that's so hard to deal with. But the reason I put verse 12 on there, because if you meet somebody who is not married in the eyes of God, that means they're living in adultery. I want you to know what verse 12 is your friend. Because verse 12 says, some people are made eunuchs by men. Some people are born eunuchs. And some people are made eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. You know, there are some people that will have to be eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. So what do we do with the next question? What about end times? What do you do if someone says, well, I, uh, uh, let's, uh, would you tell me what's going to happen when Jesus comes? Do not answer that question. You apply Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now look at this word right here. Teaching them. If you teach, baptize, you teach again. Do you know when I baptized Sharon and Jimmy Fisher, I knew he was a premillennialist. I knew he was. Now, he didn't understand every concept of it, but I knew he did not have a correct understanding about Jesus coming. But you know, in 1 Thessalonians, there's a whole church that didn't understand that. And they were Christians. And they just needed to be taught. And Paul taught them. And so teach, baptize, teach. Here's what I'm saying. When you baptize someone, it's very possible that they don't understand perfectly everything. In fact, wasn't it Apollos that had to be pulled aside and taught the way of God more perfectly? And so sometimes they're not going to know everything. They don't. And so I, I would let me demonstrate why I say this. You know that personal evangelism book? I think you've got it on that table right there. So I, I'm, I'm, at a, I'm, I'm in Georgia. And a good friend of mine comes up and says, Rob, he said, man, I'm doing this Bible study. I said, great. I said, what book do you mean? He says, book one. I said, how long have you been there? Three weeks. I said, three weeks? Book one's like an hour. He said, why are you there three? He said, I got this, your workbook, I'm going through every page. I said, no, no, why are you doing Don't do that. Don't go through it. You, you only use that to help in, in times of emergency. And he said, I wanted to know everything. I said, no, you don't. Do you think on Acts 2 they knew everything? Do you think they knew about elders and deacons in Acts 2? Do you think they understood Jesus coming again in Acts 2? I don't. So I teach, baptize, and I'm going to teach. So is Jimmy and Sharon a premillennialist today? Nope. They've been taught. What do you do after you, they become Christians? Well, we um, one of the things you need to do is you need to immediately engage in a new convert class. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to ask your elder for about an hour of time on Wednesday before after my lesson. And we're going to go over some of this. I'm going to give them some practical things. But every church needs to have a new converse class every Sunday morning. Uh, we'll let my elders teach a new converse class every Sunday morning. Anybody who's been a Christian less than two years is in that class. And they're going to go over all the first principle stuff with them. And we're going to make sure that they go through every issue that they can think of and ground them. Churches need to take new converts and hold them tightly. When you walk into the church building, Brother Crutchfield, you look for that new convert. Don't look for Steve, Brother Steve. He don't need you. He's going to come regardless. But that new convert may not. So that's what I'm talking about. You've got to embrace those new converts. I have a book called Old Testament Simplified, New Testament Simplified. It's just an easy way of studying through the Bible. I use that a lot sometimes with new converts. They say, hey, go through that book. Let's go through it together. 
Let's make the Bible make sense. I like that material. What if you only have one opportunity to teach? Um, um, I don't have it with me. Or do we have one? Does it matter? Thank you. It's called Does It Matter? No, these are on the book table. What is Does It Matter? Does It Matter takes back to the Bible. We're going to teach you on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. The red, the blue, and the green booklet condenses them into one study. If you just have one opportunity to teach somebody and you know you can't get to them again, use this. If someone's been sitting in the pews for 10 years and you know they already know most of it, use this. So this is used in unique situations. If you can use back to the Bible, use back to the Bible. It's much better. This is used in unique situations. So when we're doing mission work overseas, we use doesn't matter. We may not have enough time to do three studies. Doesn't matter is very good. We baptize a lot of people with that. And so I would recommend you get a copy of that and, and you have that kind of in your tool chest. Personal evangelist needs a tool chest. A lot of different resources. There is doesn't matter right there. How do we follow up on this seminar? Well, let me give you some quick things to do. Number one, you need to develop personal relationships with non-Christians. Use your home. You want to convert people, you have relationships with people. Brother Keith Mosier one time told us, he said, he said, uh, guys, uh, that was Brother Billy Bland. He said, guys, you need to be insulated, but not isolated. That's right. Don't be an island. You won't convert anyone if you're on an island. I want you to think about that. Number two, commit to conducting a personal Bible study. And, and so there's some of you in here that can do this. Some of you are scared to death to do it. So, so here's what I suggest. Go to the elders and say, listen, I can't conduct a personal Bible study, but if you know someone who can, I'll help them. Or maybe you say, I can conduct one, but I just need someone to help cook and clean. So I'll do the study. Of those. I mean, work together, church. Remember, body and members, you're an eye, you're, you're a foot, you're a hand. And so you got people, so work together. But commit that you're going to be a part of it. Number three, develop and train the church. Develop a training program at the local church for personal evangelism. You ought to have a training program here teaching people how to be soul winners. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. Make a Bible study method available. So I would suggest that back in the Bible, you know, we have tracks all over the place. we got bulletins everywhere. You know what I noticed? Most churches don't have any material for soul winning. So if I go into a church, I say, well, I want some material for soul winning. You're looking around, i got a track for, i got a hundred tracks. And those are great tracks you've got. But I want to know where is the soul winning material. So if I'm a member and I want to be a soul winner, where do I get it? Well, your elders have ordered it for you. Everybody gets a free copy. And then I suggest you put it out in the foyer and have as much as they need. Last year, we went through 30,000 sets of Back of the Bible. Rather than just 10% became Christians. That's a lot of Christians. So I realize, I realize, in fact, I know that more, more, a lot of people are using this and they're becoming Christians. So I, I want you to make this available. Volunteer to become a silent partner. Nicole's going to talk about that more tomorrow, ladies. What is the role of the silent partner? The volunteer say, listen, I can't leave the study, but I'll be a silent partner. We're going to spend some time. Uh, we're going to spend some time together this week. And as we close, let me share this with you. Tomorrow night, you have an opportunity to do two things. Number one, you have an opportunity to be trained on how to be a soul winner. So you come tomorrow night, I'm going to give you, I'm going to preach my heart out tomorrow night. I'm going to preach book one. But here's what you're going to also have an opportunity to do. Not only learn how to be a soul winner, if you have a non-Christian friend and you bring them, we're going to do a Bible study with them. From the pew. They're going to have that booklet too, and they're going to fill it out as we go through it. And they're going to learn what they need to know about Bible authority tomorrow night. In book two, they're going to learn what they need to learn about the church. In book three, they're going to learn what they need to do to be saved. And it's very possible that on Wednesday night, if you do your job and I do my job, that God will do his job. And he always does his job. And it's very possible that someone might walk forward to be a Christian. It's up to you. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for your heart. And brothers and sisters, we can change this world one soul at a time. As we close, I want to ask this. Does anyone have a question? Because I always open this session up to questions. And I'll give you just a few minutes to ask questions. So if there's something I have not covered, and you would like to know how to handle it. Or there's something that uh, I've said and you don't quite get it. It's okay. So we've given you a lot of information quickly. Does anybody here have questions tonight that I, they'd like us to answer? Yes, ma'am. Is there any way to spur on someone who 
I told you about my neighbor that sure. was, was a member, and she says, no, I'm not interested. Sure. I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm happy the way I am. She was a member of the church at one time. She thought, let me share with you what I do for those who are members of the church and falling away. This came to me a couple years ago, and it's so obvious. It's right here, and I never thought about it, but listen to this verse. James 5, and look at verse number 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, you fall away. Now, what's the next word in one what? Convert them. You know what we do a lot of times with fallen church members? We go over to their house and we say, I'm so sorry. Whatever it is, we're so sorry we offended you. When did the Lord ever do that? Where I know your feelings were hurt. That person's died now. You can come back. Huh? And that preacher, he's gone. And I, and I thought about this. You know, we'll be leaving. We'll let three months. I said, here's what I'd do. If I was a new preacher, go back to the ones that left and say, that preacher's gone. Come back. No, that's not what Jesus did. You know what he said? Convert him. Do you know what you need to do? Take back to the Bible in their home, do a Bible study. You know what? They, they have lost their first love. They have forgotten why they even became a Christian. And what we need to do is convert them. They need to have a Bible study. And I have found that when you have a Bible study with a Christian who's fallen away, they'll come back. Because they remember why they became a Christian. Good question. Anybody else have a question tonight? Yes, sir. All the uh, so forth all the charts and stuff. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That book's expanding all the time. And um, so we're, we're constantly trying to, to, to work on that. And and, uh, and I appreciate uh, appreciate uh, the question because that book, what it does is contains all my mistakes. <laughs> and all the, all the times I got stuck. So I just made a chart. And it also contains a lot of information I don't have time to go over. About half of it is written in book form. It's a written explanation of different things. The other half is illustrations and charts. And someone said they wanted the numbers I gave out in the first lesson. I, I talked about the church from 1911 to now. The, that chart is in that book. So if you want those numbers, they're in that book as well. Um, any other questions? You're talking about studying with an unfaithful member. What work do you use? You want to read back yes, to sir. the Bible? He's back to the Bible. Yes, sir. Because they've forgotten. They've forgotten why they became. They, if, brother, if they knew why they became a Christian, they wouldn't have fallen away to begin with. And they have forgotten. And they need to be reminded that the Lord is Lord. And the church is needed to go to heaven. So, yes, sir. Uh, I think that's what the Bible says, convert them. And I think sometimes we've forgotten that. Uh, any other questions or comments? You just want to go home, don't you? I'm so excited. I'll stay till midnight. Uh, yes, sir. Sir? Oh, I don't know. You'd have to ask the technical bit. <laughs> I do have it on my DVD. I, I, you like the whole seminar plus the book. I think what's really good about the DVD is we have a Bible study on there. You can watch it. A lot of you sit there and say, oh, I don't know. How does that really work? How does it look? Well, I, I, they even ask questions. I, I show you how to handle hard questions. and How to use those charts in that book. I, I use them in that, in that DVD. So the DVD is really a... You can have a Bible study just using the DVD. And you can sit down in your home... Have someone open the book, and I'll do a Bible study through the television with them, or through the, you know, whatever, computer. So, um, any other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, you and I spoke about this briefly uh, uh, earlier this morning, but sometimes you engage someone who just flat out doesn't believe in God, or doesn't believe sir, it's a good question. in God's Word. Uh, you have to start with that individual or that couple a little different. Yes, sir, absolutely. They're not located at the same place. Back to the Bible is for people who already believe in God in the Bible. It's not for people who don't. If they don't believe in the Bible, they don't believe in God, we start in a different place. I don't start with back to the Bible. Uh, but most of the people I meet are ready for back to the Bible. We live in the Bible Belt. But there are people who are not. Um, and if they're not, don't use back to the Bible. But here's what I find also. A lot of times people say, I don't believe in the Bible. They really do. I don't believe in God. They really do. You know what they're doing? They're trying to excuse themselves. If you'll develop a relationship with them, if you work with them, you'll a lot of times find out that those excuses go away. And, uh, and so they, they really do. They're just trying to keep you away from them. Uh, but there are, there are, I've met a few genuine atheists, but not many. Uh, most people use atheism as a, a barrier to keep you away. 
So what you got to do is build a relationship with them, and that barrier goes away usually. Um, but I, there are materials, and in fact, I'm working on some materials for back to the Bible for the inspiration of Scripture and for those who don't believe in God. In the meantime, I go to apologeticspress.org. They got some great material that you can use in a Bible study, and I'd use that for right now. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to seeing y'all tomorrow night, and uh, let's, why don't we have a word of prayer before we dismiss?